good, and you know now she's got this mm -hmm. terrible thing, and it's like I feel like it's partly my fault. I know it's not. It's but, not. I mean, but it's like you know the stress I mean, that you money know, doesn't solve everything. No, but I the mean, stress that we put her under, you know, I think had to have some kind of effect, even though she's a strong person. And she's she's a pretty together woman. Though. I mean, I don't think too many women would put up with. I mean, you haven't been in want, right? I mean, you're not no, homeless or no, you know no, going. No, we're doing okay financially, and, and you know I have to go in and get my. Social Security thing straightened out. Yeah, they're so funny. They, they, they give you money projected on what you're making. And last year I made a lot more than I did the year previous, so they gave me too much. Now they want it. Now they want it back. back yeah, so yeah. I'm saying, okay, can we just work out a deal where, you, where I, you just pay me a little less for the next few years? Oh yeah, but you have to come in, fill out paperwork, sit in line. So you know, I'm going to go through the whole rigmarole. But it's okay. I mean, they're good. I got to go over here to Luton Street. You know, I've been yeah, yeah, there yeah. a couple times. It's not that much money. It's only like. 35 grand a year, but it's, you know, every little bit helps. Yeah. Yeah, you know. Well, I get some from my daughter, too, because uh, yeah. she's, right. you know, if she's right. under, until she's 21, yeah. so that helps. So, anyway, oh. so that's my slot in life, you know, but everybody's got their problems. Everybody's got, I was talking to Steve Baker today, and I, uh -huh. oh, you know, yeah. I know he had a terrible time with his, he, his, he didn't know his wife was cheating on him, you know, God, that's going to be awful, yeah. you know. And can you imagine that? Yeah, yeah I, I mean, that's in some respects that's worse than what I'm going through because you didn't even know it, you didn't even yeah. see it coming. Yeah. And and then this person's still going to be part of your life, but they're going to be there's always going to be this tension there. Yeah. You know, I don't know. It's it's not comparable. You can't compare. But it's still. Yeah. Yeah. Anyway. Yeah, so he he was going to be one of the people who was going to be on. That's yeah, yeah. He just he's he you know gave me um he's just real crazy and busy and I, I had four or five. Media guys and all of them, you know, for one reason or another. Let me let me try. I'm going to try one more time here okay. with Al Isles, only because I think it'd be good to get him on just for a few minutes to talk about Dave Thurman. If not, oh yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, if not, uh, we I've got some good stories about okay. him. I can I can sure. get into. And I'm thinking about this this Russian thing with the Olympics. Oh, yeah. You've heard about that? That's an interesting story. Yeah, about doping and all that. Yeah, 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 yeah. Now it may be kind of timely, timely, um, because by the time we come on. They could make a decision. Um, and I was going to call him, so I didn't even reach him. I was hoping to get Rick Barry. Rick, Rick had a great comment about what, about Nate, which I'll. Yeah, the icing and the. Yeah, you heard about yeah, that. Yeah, 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 yeah. That's yeah. unlike Rick. You know, Rick is very. Hey, he's almost to the point of arrogant, but I, I always yeah. felt Rick had a right to be. And he was never obnoxious or in your face about it, you know? Mm -hmm. So we can talk a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Sure. Sounds good, but I, th I think uh, you know. Let's start off with Nate. I mean, and, and kind of relate to the big man, and the big man today is disappearing, and what yeah. Nate represented, and yeah, he had an interesting yeah. reflection of that too. Yeah. Kind of fun, because yeah, right. he was one of the one of the icons. Yeah, I like what Jabbar said about him. Oh yeah, yeah. Oh, relate that, relate that. That's yeah. a good one. Yeah. All right, you ready? Yeah. Okay, here we go. Welcome to Sports Econ 101. This is the show where we discuss sports topics from a business perspective. I'm your host, Edward Brown, along with my co-host, Bruce McGowan, longtime sports radio personality. Now, we don't have any guests today, so we're going Just to do mano a mano. Yeah. And at each uh, commercial break, we're going to ask a sports trivia question, and the theme is, they blew their chance. Ooh. It'll make a little more sense when I ask the question. Talking about like maybe the Cleveland Browns or the Boston Red Sox back in the day? You know, uh, maybe? These are actually people. Oh, people. Yeah. Oh, that's yeah. even better. So that's better. even so better. These are actually kind of hard. Yeah? yeah. Okay. We'll, we'll, we'll a lot of fun. How, we'll see how smart you are. Yeah, yeah. Okay, and the uh, first email with the correct answer is going to win a free three-day, two-night stay at the Lighthouse Resort, uh, which is located about one hour northeast of San Francisco if you get a chance to come to California. Those vacations are free. The only request is a $100 cleaning fee to cover the housekeeping expenses. And uh, just to make everyone uh, aware, the uh, radio station is not sponsoring it, but Lighthouse Resort and Marina. And we also have the special, if you go on to Sports Econ 101, uh, the website, and you click on the paintball icon, you can get 85% off which is pretty amazing because these tickets usually go for around 30 bucks and they're all around the country. So even if you're in Texas or New Hampshire or California, click on that icon and check out what kind of deal they have because it is very special. Again, you got to go to sportsecon101.com, click on the paintball uh, icon. 
And let's see here, this, this segment of Sports Econ 101 is sponsored by Pacific Private Money, providing mortgage investments that are currently yielding still over 8% secured by real estate, mostly in California. It doesn't get any more conservative than that. You've got to check them out at PacificPrivateMoney.com. In fact, they do a, uh, a little seminar once uh, a month, uh, last oh. Wednesday of the month. For anyone who wants to uh, come, and uh, that that you actually have to come to California for, oh, and you have to go uh, in Nevada. Gee, it's such a rough thing to have to come to California. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. Oh, and, the, and the weather in uh, Nevada is uh, uh, yeah. actually quite nice. Yes, it is. We're not far from Nevada. We're just a few miles away. Just a few miles yeah. away. All right, you're listening to Sports Econ 101. Don't touch that dial. We'll be right back. And you started your little. Uh, uh, yeah, yeah, yeah. Everybody gets to hear me cry about money. Well, what I usually do is, uh, because I, I don't want to forget to start right. it, is... You start it early and start then... Start early, and then I, and I, I put a little, little highlight. Oh, you're able that, to... That uh, says uh, the show starts at the two-minute mark or whatever. Oh, okay. Got that way people don't yeah. have to... You know, there you have to go through it. Yeah. I wonder if people actually do listen to that or watch that. Some of them. Yeah. It depends on, like, if we have a guest. Yeah. Okay. Guess this is... Getting a um, another good Healdsburg place for you. Oh, great! Yeah, it's called Canary Inn. Sounds good. Yeah, okay, it comes in. I'll let you know. Okay. <clears throat> Ready? <clears throat> yes, sounds good. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McGowan. Now, Bruce, we uh, we lost a, a, a San Francisco Oakland icon. Recently. Yes, we did, and, a, and an NBA icon, uh, Nate That's Thurman. Fair. A terrific uh, defensive player who played on some great Warrior teams back in the late 60s, early 70s. His career lasted about 12, 13 years. He was the kind of player you don't see that often anymore, Edward, in, in basketball. He could score, he could rebound, but he could also play ferocious defense as a big man. There are not that many big men around. And he played during an uh, era where big men dominated. Wilt Chamberlain, uh, Bill Russell, Walt Bellamy. Um, Elvin Hayes, Jabbar. Jab uh, Kareem Abdul-Jabbar, who may have been the most dominant of all. And to a man, every one of these guys uh, say that Nate was maybe the toughest defender. Now, Nate uh, is in the Hall of Fame, but his, he was often overshadowed by Russell and by Wilt because they had such a great rivalry and because those teams were always in the finals. Uh, Nate was in the finals a couple of times. Ironically, he was traded um, just before the Warriors won a championship. As a matter of fact, the deal brought in Clifford Ray in 1974-75, and Maybe the Warriors wouldn't have won it with Nate uh, that year. Who's to say? But I really got a kick out of Rick Barry, his longtime teammate, who said, you know, uh, he was the main course. I was just the dressing on the side. And that, that's, a, that's a classy thing to say about a great guy. Yeah. We got to know Nate uh, quite well. Humble, easygoing, had his own uh, barbecue restaurant in San Francisco. It was very popular for many, many, many years. And uh, just a terrific player and very, very soft-spoken. Not at all like these guys that... <laughs> Throw their hands up in the air and, you know, try to get their attention from the cameras. So, uh, Nate the Great, rest in peace, my friend. That's it. Uh, what, yeah. what he, like, he had 15 years. He had a quadruple double. He had a quadruple double uh, when he played with the Chicago Bulls late in his career. And that, that hasn't happened any, uh, very often where he had over uh, 10 points, 10 rebounds, 10 assists, and 10 blocks. So, I, I, I can't remember that ever happening. Uh, but he was that kind of a player. And it's interesting, too, Edward. He played in the shadow of Will Chamberlain when the, when the Warriors... First came to the Bay Area, Will Chamberlain came with the Warriors from Philadelphia, and Nate was drafted. And the Warriors felt because uh, Wilt was going to demand such a high salary and that Nate was coming along that they could use Nate in Wilt's place. And, and, and in fact, a couple years later, Wilt's 76ers, that's the team he was traded to, played Nate's Warriors in the NBA Finals. And it was, it was a great Finals. Uh, the Sixers that year were one of the best teams in the NBA. Had a, had a terrific record, and they beat the Warriors in six games, but uh, very competitive series, and Nate was terrific. And uh, Wilt went to the Lakers, the evil Lakers. Oh, my gosh. <laughs> well, and, and the Lakers were even better. You know, you think about it. They won, was it 30 in a row, something like something that? Like that. Yeah, yeah, until the Warriors, yeah, until the Warriors uh, uh, set a new record. I, I believe the Warriors broke their record. I'm trying to remember if they, they broke their, they broke the all-time record. The Warriors, no, they didn't break their wins in a row yeah, record. Row, yeah. yeah, I think their Lakers had, over, I think it was 33, and the Warriors, I believe, had 24 to start the season. Yeah. But that's remarkable in this day and age that you could do that 
And it, it, even in 72, 73, when the Lakers had West, and I believe Baylor had just retired, but Chamberlain was at, at the peak of his powers. That was an awesome collection of, of talent. Um, it's probably harder to do now because there's uh, more heat. I think so. And I think teams also uh, prepare a little bit more. Well, they have more uh, information available. They have more video available. They can really specialize more. It's not that the guys in the old days didn't practice and prepare. They did, but they were so familiar because you played the other team seven or eight times. You didn't need to go over videotape. You didn't need to go over scouting reports quite as much as you do today. When you only face a team sometimes two times a year, you're not that familiar with them. Do they still have the same... Uh, I mean, obviously, there's only five players on at any point. Right. Game, but do they have the same amount in, um, you know, on the bench? On the bench. That's a good question. I believe it was 12. Um, I'm trying to remember when they expanded the roster. I think you can have. I think your roster is 15. With you're only allowed to activate. I believe it's 12. Um, I may be wrong about that. Uh, but in the old days, you know, there were fewer teams, fewer jobs, more competitive. That's why when the ABA came along, Edward, in, in 1967, that really. I think was great for for the players and for the and for fans because the ABA emphasized that three point shot, which of course has become a, a stock part of our our game today. But Nate Thurman, uh, again, getting back to Nate, um, I just remember talking with him about those years and those teams, and you know he'd always kind of low key his involvement as if it was just ah that's what I was supposed to do, and you know we don't see that kind of humility um, anymore. Uh, very wonder, often. I wonder if like someone like Tim Duncan. Tim Duncan is very much like that. Like that. And I, I shouldn't say that because there are guys like that. Tim Duncan is very much like that. Give Tim Duncan credit too. What a what a great player. I mean, part of five championships. Yeah. Five different teams, and they were all very. You know, some of those teams were very different. But he was a quiet force. I remember watching and covering his last college game. His team lost Wake Forest, yeah, right. lost to Stanford in the uh, second round of the 1997 NC2A tournament. And I remember seeing this young man. He was about 20 years old at the time, just crestfallen. And I, I could just sense that uh, that, that was going to kind of spur him on. No, no pun intended. Yeah. <laughs> and, and he... Uh, Good one, Bruce. Good yeah. One. Well, you know, he probably could have played another year. I mean, you, you talk about great athletes maybe retiring before that time. Look at the year that David Ortiz is putting up yeah. with Boston. <laughs> among the league leaders in hitting, you know... Uh, he had a home run the other night against the Giants at Fenway that was just an awesome spectacle to watch. And you know, I, I like it though when players go out on top. Uh, it's it's sure. kind of a good thing uh, for them and for the game. John Elway retired, I believe, yeah. uh, when he won his second Super Bowl after after failing two or three times previous. So his legacy is always going to be those last two Super Bowls, not the ones that uh, his teams got blown out in. Yeah, that's a good point. Uh, you know, you never know really when you're on top. And starting to fall, it's hard. That, it, that it, is really hard to, to discern. And then, yeah, you know, and it really, it really does hurt the legacy. Well, it does. And and also, I think one thing I've heard is that uh, when you're playing the game, you're having so much fun, and you have such confidence that what you know, as far as time moves along, you keep thinking to yourself, "Well, I'm smarter. I, I can, okay. I can, uh, you know, make the shortcuts uh, to to get to greatness." Uh, but you know, as you get older, you realize there are no shortcuts to greatness. You still have Willie Mays. You know, was. Is an example of that. Willie had a great year at the age of 40. It wasn't a superstar kind of a year, but I think he started the season off hitting four homers in his first four games. He finished about 280 and hit about 23 homers. That was his last good year. And then the skills just, you know, kind of went away over the next couple of years. Athletes, it's very tough. You think about it. You're just hitting your prime. Guys like yourself and myself in the business world, when we are in our 40s, we're at our peak, 40s and 50s. Athletes, you know, they have to find a new venue, a, a new uh a new, you know, walk of life, and it's not easy. Well, I'm hoping that in my 50s, I, I, uh, <laughs> I learned a little bit more from my 40s. And yeah. Like, oh, the same mistakes. Yeah. But, yeah, it's a little bit more of the brain than it is. Well, it's good to part. see people mature, too. I remember Jim, it was a great story. Jim Barnett, who played with the Warriors and played with Nate Thurman and played with some great players like Earl Monroe in New York and Dr. J in Philadelphia and Crystal Pete Maravich in, in New Orleans, told me a wonderful story about um, his relationship with one guy on the team. Elvin Hayes, you remember Elvin Hayes? I sure do. And I think he might have even told us this story, but it, it's a fun story to tell again. Jim was a talker, like you and I. We love to chat. And I think Elvin Hayes was a guy, Jim told me once, he says Elvin Hayes was was kind of a, uh, a naive kid, and he didn't like white people when he first came in the league, and he didn't like me. And we had an argument once at an airport, he said, and, and Elvin came after me, and I ran. He says, and I, and I was too fast. He couldn't catch me. <laughs> and then Elvin, I guess, that early on when Elvin was playing with the San Diego Rockets, who were an expansion team in the late 1960s, 
Um, he was not following instructions of the coach during a game. He kept dropping the ball and then letting it go out of bounds. And the coach finally, you know, called timeout and said, what's, what's going on, Elvin? Why, why are you dropping the ball? And he goes, I, I catch ball. And, and those were his exact words. And, well, you're not doing it. So we're going to change the play. It doesn't mean he uses the, I guess Elvin used the, um, the F word and told him to, you know, where to go. He says, you're not going to be around anyway in a couple of days. And, in fact, he was fired. They bring in a guy named Alex Hannum, who was Jim Barnett, uh, referred to him as a SH kicker. You know, <laughs> you can put in fill in the blanks there. He was a former player, big power forward. It led the Sixers as a coach to the championship. And Hayes was kind of lollygagging it during practice. And so uh, Hannum told everybody else to go outside for a few minutes, take a break. He was going to talk to Elvin because Elvin was the big star. The players come back in. Elvin had been, you know, kind of half going through the motions. He's running sprints up and down and dunking the ball. And Jim said, I can only imagine that Hannum shoved him up against the wall, put his hand on his throat, told him, you better, you know, do what I tell you to do. But Jim told me later, he said, you know, Elvin has changed. He's gone through a transformation. He says, if I saw him today, I'd go up and hug him, and I might even give him a kiss on the cheek. Aww. And you know something? He deserved it. <laughs> I love Jim Barnett. He's the Warriors uh, TV broadcaster now, by the way, many, many, many years of doing that. So I, lo I love Jim Barnett telling those stories. <laughs> All right, we're going to cut through our first commercial uh, break with the trivia question. Here it is. This is the theme is um, they blew their chance. Uh -huh. This 23-season National League shortstop was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1954. In wow. 1925, he helmed the Cubs as a player manager. He failed so bad at managing, the team not only fired him as manager, but traded him to the Dodgers. Who was this one-season manager? Oh, jeez. All right. Stay with us. Sports Econ 101. We'll be right back. I should know that one, but I'm drawing a blank. Mm. Hall of Famer, though, huh? Supposedly. <laughs> That's what the question do say. Yeah. Interesting. He failed as a manager. But he was playing, he was playing with the Cubs. Who was it the short stop the Cubs? You you'll uh you'll know the name. It's kind of okay. interesting. I'm usually good with the old timers, especially yeah. the nineteen twenties teams. I don't know why. <laughs> Probably just fascinated with history that yeah. most people could care less about. Yeah, it's just something about baseball history that just. Well, it's the it's, personalities. You, know? yeah, you have more time to really get to know players because they're out there more often and there's a lot of standing around and they're more distinct. You know, We can talk a little bit about that. That'd be good to kind of maybe segue into. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with former Bruce McGowan. Here was our first trivia question about they blew their chance. This 23-season National League shortstop was inducted into the Hall of Fame in 1954. In 1925, he held the, I guess that means he was at the helm of the main Cubs as a player manager. He failed so bad at managing the team, not only fired him as manager, but traded him to the Dodgers. Who was this one-season manager? I'm thinking about uh, players at that time. I'm thinking of a guy like Rogers Hornsby, but he was with the Cardinals. Yeah, but he was with the Cardinals. Yeah, and uh, drawing a blank here. Okay, he's got an interesting name. Okay. His, like, I'm going to guess his first name that they have now here is... Uh, is a nickname? Is a nickname. Okay. Uh, think of an animal. A small animal. A small animal. Oh, uh, the rat. Uh, yeah. Close, close. Stretch uh, it out a little bit. Uh, stretch it out a little bit. Uh, <laughs> not rat, but... Uh, Bugs, bugs. Bugs. Oh, Bugs. Uh, yeah, but not Bugs. But <laughs> oh, no, not Bugs. There was a guy named Bugs Moran. Yeah, that's no. sure. no. a close, though. Okay. Rabbit Maranville. Oh, Rabbit Maranville. Yeah, Rabbit Maranville. Not a great hitter, but a feisty player to really fine shortstop. When we were talking about this off air just a second ago, one of the reasons I think baseball history is always so fascinating, Edward, is that we do get a chance during a long season to really get to know these guys, to see them. To understand them, you know, when you're a kid, you always try to imitate the guy yeah, at the plate. Yeah. We used to have a game where you'd stand at the plate, 
and you do the the strange batting stance, and we try to and guess. Yeah, see, I remember yeah, so we did that too. Yeah, yeah, yeah. 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 Someone like Willie Stargell. Oh, Willie Stargell, Joe Morgan, Morgan yeah, with with a little easy. with that little uh, hitch in his in his arm. Yeah. There was a guy named Dave Nicholson back in the '60s who used to put his elbow up real high, and he'd peek out over his elbow, and it was the strangest thing I'd really? ever seen in my life. Life, yeah. Then of course, Craig Council. Yeah, I was always, just gonna say, Craig Council. Craig Council yeah. always looked like there was some invisible marionette up there pulling him <laughs> skyward, <laughs> and he was just stretched out. It was the strange. That's the strangest batting. Stance I've ever seen. Dick McAuliffe, another guy who had the, the foot in the bucket, you know, he was almost facing the pitcher, the great second baseman with the Detroit Tigers. Um, Wait, when you say his foot in the bucket? Well, you know, I, I mean, he, he was outside the, what is it, outside, outside the, the box. box, outside the box, yeah. yeah. You're not supposed to do that. Well, yeah, you know, he was not, wasn't completely outside the box, but kind of. And of course, the box gets sort of obliterated over the yeah. course of time, so the, the umpire. I love the way Willie Mays used to come up. He had this habit of digging in with his left uh, spite and kind of, you know, getting himself set, and he'd, he'd wave the bat around. There was just something that yeah. got you. It was almost like he was winding himself up. Yeah, yeah. And the, the air of anticipation when Willie would come to the plate, I, I went to a lot of games at Candlestick in the 60s as a kid right. to see him play. When he'd stride out onto the field, if he was in a pinch-hitting situation, there was a murmur that used to rise from the crowd in the anticipation of seeing this great guy play. I remember a game against Philly. Uh, back in, oh gosh, 1970, Willie's at the tail end of his career. He comes out as a pinch hitter. The crowd is going crazy. The the Giants need a big hit. Comes up, pinch hit home run. You know, you know what? Great I was, I didn't go yep. to that many games, but I, that's yep. what, I you, did actually go to that game. Yeah, yeah, it was well, the yeah, yeah. Yeah. Of the night. yeah, that's right. I remember that. Yeah, and they ended up winning, I think, an extra innings. And Willie, Willie was just, yeah, you know, so nice. cool. He loved, he lived for those moments. It's interesting to note, though, Willie, his rookie year was in the on deck circle when Bobby Thompson. Yeah. Hit the home run yep. that won the pennant, and Willie in later years admitted he said, "I was just hoping that Bobby would hit one. I did not want to have to get up there." And when Thompson hit the home run, Willie was so amazed. Everybody else was on the field, and he he figured, "Okay, base hit, couple runs score, I'm up next." He didn't realize the game was over. He said, "I was so stunned." <laughs> he threw the bat away. Hey, let's go out and celebrate. All right, you know. But you know, it's funny. He says that like then, but yeah. you know. Ten years into his career, he's probably not, no, no. I want to be Bobby Thompson. Oh yeah. <laughs> now, the thing about Willie is Willie is a, another guy who is a great storyteller, and and he, you know, the great thing about these older guys is they tell their stories and then they embellish them a little bit, which is the <laughs> sign of a good storyteller. And they change it a little bit and they add something to it. I mean, if you don't do that, but I think baseball allows itself for that that word because of the the great uh, periods of you know inactivity when everybody's standing around in the hot sun and you know players get a chance to really. You get to see them. You get to see what they look like. They're all ages. They're all sizes. You know, baseball is the only yeah. sport where the athletes can That's be anything true. from a little kind of a runny guy to some tall, uh, you know, raw bone pitcher like a Madison Bumgarner, or how about a giant like uh, Randy Johnson? Yeah, you know, 11. yeah. Or you got a guy like Jose Altuve down in Houston who's like five five. Yeah, but a great player. Yeah, terrific player. Well, I remember reading something. Uh, with some it was like a long maybe it was a Sports Illustrated or something with, with Willie and. It was really interesting because he was noticing little things, mm -hmm. like you know the catcher had. Uh, uh, it looked like he hurt his leg a little bit, mm -hmm. and he remembered that. Oh and yeah. Again, he could have been embellishing, but it's still a great no, story. No, no, you know, so he, you know it's a good point. When he, you know, and what were the odds that he was going to score in the game? Yeah, I don't know. You know, but he, he remembered. You know, this catcher's got a bad left foot, so I'm going to slide around. To, I mean, it was oh, like sure. this whole big strategy. You know, it was like, well, they always talk about a baseball IQ, and they said Willie had the highest one. And he he admitted that uh, after he took batting practice, he would stay and watch the other team, and he'd look for little things. You know, like how this particular outfielder might have shaded uh, a certain hitter, and he would direct the defense from center field. You know, he'd tell guys where to yeah. move on certain uh -huh. plays, certain pitches. Willie was. He didn't have a lot of other interests outside of baseball, and he really didn't. It was kind of stunning when you talked to Willie about just everyday things, how little he seemed to know. But when it came to baseball, not only did he seem to know everything, but you ask him a question, even today at the age of 84, about a game, a pitcher, a moment. He can tell you the exact count, the moment he hit the, you know, what pitch he hit on uh, for the home run back in some, you know. When's he going to be on our show? I, I got to get him on. Got to get one. I don't know. You said his eyes, is it eyesight or his, his, his eyesight is, is is pretty much shot. Uh, you know, he looks great physically. I mean, he's 84. Willie always took care of himself. He, he ate well. Uh, he didn't overeat. He never drank. As a matter of fact, uh, great story when the Giants won the pennant in 62 and beating LA in the three game playoffs, uh, Willie took a, a bottle of champagne and took a, a quaff. And he said he got sicker than a dog. And he says that's one of the few times he's ever had alcohol. Wow. 
So, so in 84, with his eyesight going, right. he probably only hit about two seconds. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. I saw him in an old-timers game. About, that was about 30 years ago, and, and he was hitting the ball over the fence. And uh, Somebody asked him afterwards, you know, how'd you get three balls over the fence? And he, and he just kind of laughed, and then he had a wonderful cackle. <laughs> yeah, like that. But he didn't put up with any nonsense. If he didn't like you or didn't know you, he could be kind of rude. You had to get uh-huh. to know Willie. It's kind of like Barry Bonds. I got to know Barry Bonds and Willie Mays, you know, fairly well. I wasn't buddies with either one of them, but they were always on a first-name basis. And they understood that I wasn't going to bother them, and I wasn't going to ask them non-baseball questions. And we always got along well. But it's, I think it's true with anybody. If you, if you get off on the wrong foot, and especially if you're in the media, um, in those days, in the, in the 80s and the 70s, and even a little bit back to the 60s with Willie, you know, players would just cut you out, and that's just the way it is. So, uh, if you were starting to tell a story, though, about an old timers game, and well, he hits three home runs, or he hits balls over. And well, he hit, well, no, I mean, he hit three three balls over the fence, and you know, a guy says, you know, how'd you go out and do that batting practice? I mean, I, that's not something you could do. And he goes, I, I just just do what I normally do. He goes, yeah, but but, but you're, you're you're 52 years old. He goes, well, you know, I could still do it. Yeah. And when he believed it, you know, you had to believe. It. I think that that arrogance, maybe that's not the right word, but that confidence, yeah. you got to have that. Even in your latter years, look at Nolan Ryan. He pitched till he was what forty six, and he yeah. pitched two or three no hitters after he turned forty. Yeah, I saw one of those no hitters, and it was an amazing thing to to behold because he had one of those rare arms. He never got tired. He never had an injury to an arm. I don't believe. And the ball was just sizzling the last inning. I mean, everybody in the ballpark, and this was during the time when the A's were really good. The yeah. Oakland A's were really good uh-huh. back in the late 80s, early 90s. He was just mowing them down. You know, Canseco, McGuire, Ricky Anderson. Anderson. Yeah. 5,000 strikeouts. Yeah, that's right. Yeah. I mean, he was just on a roll. And that, that was fun to watch. I mean, you love to watch the great ones. It was funny. I was uh, uh, just fooling around with the, um, the local professionals here in the San Rafael Pacific. And I was saying, you know, I, I've only, I'd love to, you know, try to hit a, a 90 mile an hour baseball. You know, <laughs> he goes, well, okay, well, you know, we'll put you some, put you in some catcher's gear. And I'll, yeah. I'm thinking, you put me in catcher's gear, I might get able to swing the bat. Just, you know? just get an idea of how to catch one of those balls. Well, if you ever go to a batting cage, it's interesting. You can, you can put the, uh, the batting cage uh, pitching machine at a certain uh, level, like 75 or 80 miles. I went out there and tried to hit a ball that was just under 80, and I couldn't even hit it. Well, is that from a pitching machine? Yeah, yeah. See, the pitching machine is harder than uh, a guy throwing. Really? Yeah, because the, a guy throwing, you can tell when it's leaving his hand. Okay. But a pitching machine, it just kind little, of comes out of nowhere. Yeah. And you really... But I would think with a the, with the pitch that's thrown by a, a pitcher, it might have a little more movement on it, perhaps, unless the guy's throwing you just a straight fastball. But even a, a straight fastball sometimes will... Not a straight fastball, but a fastball will rise or yeah. drop. It just depends. I mean, I love watching some of these guys who, you know, Sergio Romo for the Giants, uh, who has just come back onto the team, he's a setup man, and has been a part of their three World Series titles. He has this thing, he calls it a Frisbee slider, and the ball seems to just, you know, it's almost like it, it discombobulates and then comes back together again. And it, it, when it's on, it's hard, it's impossible to hit that ball. I don't know how you throw it, but he's been, since he came back, I think that's a key to the Giants' success. Their, their bullpen has been pretty weak. Uh, in the first half, and if they can get him back as a setup guy, I think their their bullpen could fall into place. Yeah, you you watch him, and he doesn't really throw that fast. No, and he's not a suffering hit. No, he's not. But he's got the, it's a slider, right? It's a slider, and it just has a lot of movement. I mean, it, it comes, it changes movement sometimes two two or three times, and it's really hard to gauge. You have to kind of sit on it. And how do you sit on a pitch like that? Because you don't know where it's going to go. And you're sure it's not a spitball. No, but the thing is, if it's not doing that, it's very hittable. Yeah, well, yeah. that reminds me of Eckersley He's... in the 88 World Series with Kirk Gibson. Well, he had one pitch that he threw that was really tough to hit, and he hadn't thrown it in that at bat. And it was a long at bat. It was a, I think it was a nine-pitch at bat. And Gibson was guessing that he was going to throw that pitch. It was called a backdoor slider. Oh, yeah, that's right. And he turned on it. He, he got inside it and turned on it, and Eckersley, you know, doffed his cap to him later, figuratively speaking, yeah. because that's a tough pitch to hit. All right, we're going to cut to our next commercial break here. Uh, again, the trivia theme is they blew their chance. The Angels just didn't like me. I played for them for five games in 1967, and that was it for my playing career. Wow. In 1988, I replaced manager Cookie Rojas to become the Angels' 15th manager in 28 season. seasons. My 0-8 record didn't impress the owner, and he never called me back. <laughs> Who am I? Oh, geez, you're talking about somebody pretty obscure, huh? Uh, yeah, this one is kind of tough. Okay. This one, this I got it. I wouldn't know. Again, no. it's kind of a funny first name. Oh, yeah, yeah. Okay. 
That was good. Sports Econ 101 will be right back. I like those kind of <laughs> off the wall questions. That's yeah, good. Every once in a while. Yeah. yeah. Cookie Rojas. I never forget a game. Kansas uh, was he managing Kansas City? Who was he managing? Uh, the Angels. I'll, I'll tell you the story. Yeah, I'll tell you the story. It's pretty funny. <laughs> uh, so where are you guys? Are you guys uh, going on vacation? Uh, yeah, we're just we're gonna go. Um, let's see. Uh, next week, I'm taking Colette up to Geyserville to that oh. Mar old Merrill. I did some research. It's a really nice place. Okay. Then the following week. Taking Molly's coming out of camp. We're gonna go to do that um, that uh, spa over in Livermore. That oh looks yeah, like yeah, yeah, the purple orchid. Yeah, just do yeah, a couple. You know, really we'll just nice. get there in the evening, hang out, do some stuff in Livermore on that day. And then the next day, yeah. we'll we'll head up to Yosemite. Yeah, head up to Yosemite towards uh, Coulterville and try that little um, family uh, place where we could kind of use that as a base to go into Yosemite in a couple days. Oh, oh, yeah, use some some of those up. Yeah. All right. Yeah. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Again, I'm Edward Brown, your host, along with Bruce McKinley. We asked a very obscure question here on this last night. Here it was. Here it is. The Angels just didn't like me. I played for them for five games in 1967, and that was it for my playing career. In 1988, I played, I, re me, I replaced manager Cookie Rojas to become the Angels' 15th manager in 28 seasons. My 0 and 8 record didn't impress the owner, and he never called me back. Mm. Who am I? God, I got no idea. I remember uh, Gene Mock was there in 1986 when they blew that 3 1 lead to Boston in the ALCS. I, I can't remember that. Yeah. Uh, now, th this was uh, somebody I, I don't even know this yeah. name, but again, uh, if, if her, oh, go uh, ahead. her nickname he's got uh, an animal. Yeah. Uh, one that's usually in the cold. Okay. And then uh, the last name is the only thing I can think of is uh, the love boat. <laughs> You got me. Moose Stub Stubing. Oh, yeah. No, Moose Stubing was actually a very good scout and coach. Um, and had a good reputation. He was a base baseball life. good coach for the Angels. Uh, no, no. Well, some guys were just not meant to be managers. Some guys uh, were meant to be uh, talent evaluators, scouts, coaches. Um, you mentioned Cookie Rojas. Got a quick story about Cookie Rojas, who was a great second baseman with Philadelphia uh, back in the 1960s. And in early 70s, and he, he was managing the Angels in the late 80s. Uh, this would have been right after this fellow. As a matter of fact, it might have, he might have replaced him. And of course, you remember the Angels were pretty good in the mid 80s. They had Gene Mock. They had a great team. You know, Mike Witt was on that team. Donnie Dave Moore. Dave Henderson played for them. Well, no, Dave, Dave was with the Boston. He had the home, Boston. That's he had the home against, run against the Angels. That's he had the home run off of Donnie right. Moore, which kind of ruined Donnie Moore's career. Where Donnie Moore went on to, you know, sadly kill himself several years later after that. Never, never recovered. They all, they always refer to it as the pitch that killed. Um, and the, this is the 1986 ALCS. You know, Henderson hits the home run, ties the game, and then the Red Sox came back, won that game, and won the next two, go to the World Series. But Cookie Rojas, they're playing the A's. They got swept by the A's. The A's. This is when the A's were just awesome in, in '88, early season. The A's got off to a, just an impressive start. And <laughs> in the clubhouse afterwards, with a bunch of writers, and writers have a tendency when a manager has lost a game. To be very quiet and very timid and very fearful about asking the first question. I, on the other hand, had to get my questions asked quickly, get in, get out, and move on because I had to get as many interviews as I could. I was I was beating a bunch of radio networks, so I said something about, "Gosh, yeah, Cookie, I mean, it's tough to go up against this A's team. They're just an awesome collection of talent." He looks at me kind of disdainfully and he says, "The A's are awesome, man. We're really worried about them." Blinking, blinking, A's. I says, it is especially tough to lose uh, a close game like this after two blowouts. He goes, no, I'm going to buy a blinking birthday cake and put candles on it and celebrate the beacon loss. <laughs> <laughs> never forget okay, that Tell one. us what you really feel. Yeah, tell us how you really feel. Billy Martin, I tell you, if you got on the on the wrong side of the fence with him, oh, man, he would embarrass you. And I remember one time I asked him a couple of questions in a row because nobody else was asking them. And he looks over at me and goes, what is this, a one-on-one -on -one interview? You see, there are uh, other people around here that would like to ask a question. I said, oh, no, I, I appreciate that. Thank you. Thank you very much. <laughs> Nobody asked a question. Nobody asked a question. Billy uh, had Billy, a, would you like to ask us a question? Yeah. <laughs> Never saw evidence of Billy's temper until his last year in Oakland in 1982 when the A's late in the season lost a game. And I heard all this terrible uh, 
you know, commotion coming from his office. We were outside the locker room at the time. The locker room had been, or the clubhouse had been closed. And it sounded like furniture breaking and screams. And <laughs> we go in later, and, and Billy walked by us, and he had this cut over his eye. He, he just destroyed his office, and things were breaking against the wall. And I guess a piece of glass flew off the wall and hit him in the face. And he just, he was gone by the next day. He was out of there. But Billy had a tendency. He, he was the most paranoid individual, but he would always be thinking two or three steps ahead of you. And unconventional. I mean, he, he did things that nobody did. Really. What was he, about 5'8"? Little scary. guy. He was tough. He had a, had a tough uh, mom who raised him to be a fighter. She said, don't ever come home telling me that somebody's bullying you. You, know, you hit him first. <laughs> and, he, and Billy did. Billy would often hit first because he knew he wasn't a great fighter. But if he got in the first punch, there was a good chance he could get in the second, the third. And by the time the, the guy realized what was going on, it would be too late. He'd be down and <laughs> the fight would be over. That was Billy. Billy used his aggressive, almost paranoid personality to win, and uh, it, it worked for a long time. It's sad what happened to him off the field. He was just a, a miserable failure uh, as a person, um, and he had a lot of he had a lot of good friends, but he had he had some demons. And yeah. um, he, in fact, I remember he died on Christmas. Christmas Day, Day. he, he, he well, so he was like he, drunk driving. Yeah, he, he and a buddy were driving. His friend was driving, and the friend fell asleep at the wheel, and they rolled down the side of the hill, and Billy broke his neck, and that was it. Billy, I think, was fifty-seven or fifty-eight. Might have um, been. You know, Billy had a tendency, he'd take over a team that was underachieving. Within a couple of years, they'd be a, a, a champion. Sometimes a contender the next year. He did that in New York. He did that in Detroit. He did that in Texas. He did that in Oakland. But uh, inevitably, what would happen is he'd burn out. Yeah. He, his, his, his style of managing, not his style of managing, but his personality just wore on people. I wonder if, uh, you know, coming from the Yankees, the way they played, you know, winning all those championships in the 50s. And he was a second baseman, right? Second baseman. He was a very good, good, very good second baseman. baseman. Yeah, yeah. Um, you, you know, sometimes just carrying that into a clubhouse, it's like, you know, you realize who you're playing for. Yeah. And it kind of steps up the level. Well, I think players respected him. I think they, they feared him. I think they realized that he had extreme, uh, extremely deep knowledge about the game, and, and they appreciated that. But um, he also was unpredictable, and if you got on his wrong side, I remember Shooty Babbitt, who was a guest of ours on the show, who's a scout, a great name, Shooty Babbitt. Shooty only played for the A's one year, the 80, 81, when they went to the playoffs, and he got on Billy's wrong side. Billy just never liked him, just never liked him, and, you know, Billy was a product of his time, too. He's a, he was a little bit prejudiced towards African Americans, although, you know, today they'd say that much more so than he did than they would back in those days, but I think that Shooty was, you know, from the same the same area. They both grew up in the East Bay, and for some reason, he just there was something about Shooty that just rubbed him the wrong way. Shooty says it was too bad because it he never was able to really get his career going after that. But he had that one year with Bill, and he said he learned so much from Billy watching it. But I wonder, um, why, I mean, Shooty was a decent player. He was a decent and, player. Know, why didn't he get traded? Or well, was, you know, I like there are a lot of guys. It's it's true in all walks of life, Edward. There are a lot of people that that do okay, you know, when they get their cameo opportunity, but then it for whatever reason they don't know the right person. The right opportunity doesn't present itself again, and you're sort of lost in the shuffle, and that's that's you know, part of life. You know, mentioning about that, I was just thinking about um, you know Refrigerator Perry. Oh you yeah, yeah. About sure. Recently. It's just like yeah. you know, what the poor guy is just I know. Like, what the hell? Well, yeah, we expect so much from these athletes. We forget that they're human beings. Some of them do very well once they get out of the game. And, you know, look at Charles Barkley. He's had such a terrific career as a, as a commentator. Yeah. But then you get somebody, you know, like our friend Mike Norris, who was the former pitcher for the A's, who really has struggled with substance abuse. And Mike is just a sweetheart. I love Mike Norris. But he's had some rough times. And, you know, uh, there have been times where he's disappeared for, for days, and people wondered where he was. And, you know, he's, he's uh, had some physical problems. And there are a lot of guys that are much worse shape than him. And Donnie Moore, we mentioned Donnie Moore. He, he was a terrific reliever back in the mid-'80s, but... Gave up that home run to Dave Henderson and was never the same after that. Just like oil can boy, same thing. Yeah, yeah. Well, I mean, you know, what happens is, you know, you have that one moment in the sun where your opportunity is there and you blow it, like you were talking about the theme of our trivia today. And sometimes that's just too much. You know, it, it can it can change. It's like the you know, it's like the turning point in a game. A guy gives up a home run, the, the ball game is is forever changed. You well, know, is uh, you know. Has Boston finally uh, forgiven Bill Buckner? Oh, I think so. You win three titles in, in the last, what is it, uh, the last 10 years, and, and I think everybody, or more than 10 years, but I mean, they three different, very different teams. Yeah, no, that's still, to this day, the Bill Buckner uh, situation to me is uh, has always been 
one that uh, it's really a shame because he had such a great career. Maybe yeah. not a Hall of Fame career, but he played, I believe, almost 20 years. But he had that one moment where the ball, he just blew it. He, and the thing was, John McNamara, should have, the manager of the Red Sox at that time, should have taken him out. He had a very reliable glove man in Dave Stapleton. He didn't do it for whatever reason. And, you know, Buckner was hurting. He played a long game. And, you know, ground ball, routine ground ball right through his legs. You know, it was kind of like Charlie Brown, <laughs> you know. <laughs> Like Charlie Brown and Lucy, the ball goes through your legs, the game's over. Oh no, you're the goat. I remember, I'll never forget, Edward. I'm sitting in a hotel in, in New Hampshire with a buddy of mine. We'd been hiking on a little vacation, a friend of mine from New York, huge Mets fan. And we're watching this game, and my friend goes nuts when the, when the winning run scored and Buckner had the ball go through his legs. Next door, there were a bunch of guys watching television in the next room, and I could hear all these anguished cries. And it was like the Billy Martin situation furniture. Being smashed, and I mean, yeah. the the people in Boston really took that one hard. That might yeah, have been the toughest. The thing was, it, it was only game six. It was game six. They, 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 everybody, everybody just knew. Well, they it, going was, to win. it was like the Giants in 2002. They they blew oh, yeah, a five right. nothing lead in game six to the Angels, and everybody knew they were going to lose game seven. Or like the Warriors, when they lost uh, the, the games, they lost. Everybody was thinking, okay. You know, they'll come back and win one of these. But when they got to Game 7, you had this sinking feeling that it was just not to be. Yeah, which is kind of interesting because, uh, I mean, I'm, I'm still upset about the uh, San Francisco Giants 2002 uh, Angels one. I remember that one so well. But for some or strange reason, the, this Cleveland Warrior one. Doesn't bother you as much? Well, it's much. because the Warriors won the, the title and the year I think, before. I think that's what it is. And the Giants hadn't won a title. I, yeah, since, I think, and yeah, I think that's why the Boston thing hurt so much. The Boston Red Sox hadn't won since, what, 1918? 1918, yeah. yeah. You know, something the like San Francisco that. Giants hadn't won at all. Hadn't won at all. Hadn't won at all. In 1954, 54, yeah. And that was when uh, Cleveland was favored. Uh, favored, in, favored to win that one, yeah. yeah they slept yeah, them on four. Right. Willie Mays made the great over-the-shoulder catch, but... Uh, you know, it's just, uh, boy, when you have those moments in, in the sun and your opportunity and you, and you let it get away, that's just, it's really tough. Yeah, really hard. I don't like thinking about that. No. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, we, in just a little bit, we're going to go to our, our last uh, trivia question. Right. And uh, let's see. This, Does it relate, uh, relate to that at all? That well, what we're talking again, about kind of the same scene. Well, the, the theme is they blew their chance. Yeah. So, uh, we, We'll definitely get into that. We have just another minute before our, our trivia question break. I was going to say, uh, even as a as somebody who didn't play on a high level in any sport, you know, outside of high school, maybe in a little bit of college, and I'm sure you're in the same boat, you can probably remember a moment, you know, little league, high school baseball, whatever, where there was, you know, you had a chance. I never forget. I was pitching a no hitter in little league last day of the season. My dad takes me out in the sixth inning because Bobby Brooks, our catcher, hadn't pitched a game all year. And my dad wanted him to give him, give him a chance. He goes in, he gives up a bunch of runs, we lose the game. And I'll never, oh we had a God. team party afterwards, and I, I was just furious. And I reminded my dad of this years later, and he doesn't even, he never even remembered it. Of course he didn't remember it, because it wasn't that big a deal to him. But it was a big deal to me. Now, did they play nine innings? No, it was back in, back in those days, it was six innings. Yeah. But I was, I was pitching a no-hitter last game of the season. Uh, and he, he puts me out in left field, he tells me, you know, if they're gonna hit the ball out to you. No, they hit the ball to center and to right. The two two other outfielders couldn't catch the ball. Remember, this one kid picked it up, dropped it, picked it up, dropped it, picked it up, dropped it. Meanwhile, the runners circling the bases. Everybody's going crazy. All his teammates are out there. The parents are jumping up and down, and I'm just sitting there throwing my glove on the on the ground. Well, bad news bears. Oh my god. How old are you? Twelve. Eleven. Eleven. Yeah. 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 Right. Same age as my daughter is today. So, you know. <laughs> Does she play softball? No, you know, she's in there. She really likes to swim. I, I'm getting her into surfing, yeah. yeah. And she likes to get oh. in the water. She's not afraid of the ocean. Uh, she's a good swimmer, and she really likes to, to just swim. Have a, just have a healthy respect for the ocean. Oh, yeah, yeah. The ocean always has the final say. Yeah, yeah. Oh, that's a good point. Yeah. All right, here's our last trivia question. Again, the theme is they blew their chance. Blew it. So here it is. I had a, I had a, I had a, a bat in my career, but mostly was overshadowed by my brave teammate Hank Aaron. He had one one big at bat. You're saying? One. Yeah, it's a, it's just I had a bat in my career. I don't understand what that means, but okay, okay overshadowed by my brave teammate Hank Aaron for many seasons. Seasons. I did, however, hit four home runs in one game. Ah. Four of my 336 shots. Right. I managed the Cleveland Indians in 1967. I know this thing. Okay, to, yeah. to a 75 and 87-8 place record. Mm. This was it for me. Who am I? All right? Okay. That's the question. I'm not going to read it again. Too hard to understand. Okay. All right. Uh, stay with us uh, because Sports Econ 101 will be right back with some closing comments. All right. I know who that is. 
Yeah. Last night, uh, who was it uh, for Boston? Almost had three home runs or four home runs. What's right. the guy's name? Uh, the first baseman. God, he, he just hit two of them off of uh, Kane, then he hit one more off Suarez. Um, yeah, what's going on? We just we're, we're just they're, they're starting game. pitching is just hit. You know, it's like yeah, Kane you know, when, when pitching is is off, it's really tough because. Yeah. It can sometimes take a while to get back on. Hitting kind of come, comes with. Yeah. I'm going to say this is kind of cutting in and out here. Was it yeah, what, um, okay. Yeah, okay. Okay. Then now it's a, it, was it cutting in and out before? It, it was, was, it? was, yeah. And yeah. I couldn't figure it out. That wasn't, sure wasn't too bad, was it? No, no. I was able to kind of. Yeah, okay. It's a little um, short, I think. P Peavy was pitching. He had a couple of good games. Yeah. Before. Yeah. 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 They're trying to squeeze as much as. They're trying to squeeze, you know, because they're paying Kane all this money. I know. Kane is done. He doesn't yeah. have it anymore. And PB is the same. And you can't keep him around just because of his beautiful wife. <laughs> <laughs> That's right. All right, let's have some closing comments. Okay. Then I'll go to the bathroom. There you go. <laughs> well, we, <laughs> now that we'll do number two. All right. Welcome back to Sports Econ 101. Last time for today, I'm Edward Brown, along with Bruce McGowan. Last trivia question. Uh, and the theme is they blew their chance. I had a bat in my career, but mostly was overshadowed by my Braves teammate Hank Aaron. Maybe what it was, I've had a great bat in my career. Maybe and that's what it is, yeah. yeah. Uh, my uh, teammate Hank Aaron for many seasons. I did, however, hit four home runs in one game. Four of my 336 shots. So 336 home runs, pretty good. Yeah. I managed the Cleveland Indians in 1967 to a 75 and 87. Eighth place record. Ouch. And that was it for me. Who am I? Hall of Famer Eddie Matthews? No. No. Joe Adcock. Oh, Joe Adcock. Yeah, the first baseman. Yeah, that's wow. God, I should have known that one. I remember <laughs> Joe Adcock was. Yeah, Joe Adcock was one of the few guys that uh, traded a traded a headdress for. Uh, well, you know, whatever. He, uh, that's kind of a rude thing to say, but I'm just saying he braves to Indians. You know, hey. Oh, oh, yeah. Okay. So, I was waiting for you. Yeah, no, he was a he was a big, strong, raw bone first baseman. Great hitter. I'm thinking of Eddie Matthews, but Eddie, Eddie, Eddie Matthews was even more. Prolific as a uh, as a hitter. I don't think he hit four home runs though. So. No, I, I think you're right. Not too many guys did. Not that. too many. Willie Mays did it. Willie Mays, yeah, that's yeah, yeah. That was Willie in the early sixties. That was in the early sixties against the Braves at Old uh, County Stadium, and he did it. He could have had uh, another one, uh, but uh, I believe he hit one in the fence and it, and it was caught. That's so, the brass one. Yeah. All right. All right. Here's our thoughts for the day. The key is to keep company only with people who uplift you. Hmm. Uplift you. Whose presence calls forth your best. That's a good. That that's a good, a good one. Yeah, okay. I like that one. And do you want to know who you are? Don't ask. <laughs> Act. Action will delineate and define you. Ooh. Who said that? I don't know. One of our presidents, Thomas Jefferson. Thomas Jefferson. Right? Probably the action. probably the smartest man we ever had in the White House too. Probably yeah. Yeah, he's, he, he was amazing. Uh, he was an amazing. Oh, we could get off on a, a whole tangent about all of his interests and. Strengths. Uh, yeah, have you ever been to Boston with the Paul Revere house? Oh, yeah, yeah. Paul Revere, he must have been about five foot one. Not a big guy. guy. Yeah, a little bit. That's right. That's right. <laughs> must have been easy on the horse. Okay, tune in next week to Sports Econ 101. We're going to be discussing sports topics from a business perspective, giving away more free vacations for answering sports trivia questions. Thanks for listening. On behalf of our team, I'm your host, Edward Brown. We'll see you next week. Good night, America. So long. All right. You know the horse. Uh, oh yeah, yeah. One of my land I'll tell you a story about that when you get back. All right, yeah. Like, oh, gotta go. It's gonna be interesting. Gotta go.